Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. Well, today we wrap up our series that we've entitled Heroic Faith. We've been making our way through one chapter in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, where there is one story after another of people who endured with God, who finished the race of faith. And just before we jump into that, I want to let you know about something important that's coming up. There's going to be a baptism class And, you know, a lot of people are familiar with baptisms, and maybe you also understand that different churches have different understandings along with that. What does it mean? Um, What does it take for somebody to participate in that? And this is an opportunity to bring your questions, to get them answered, and for you to attend this is not, you know, your commitment that you're going to go ahead. It's an opportunity just to hear how we at Washington Heights understand it, what it means and uh, what it means to go public with that faith. And just, oh, by the way, we have somebody who's doing that very thing today. And so I'm going to throw it over to Pastor Jimmy. Yes, we do. It's an exciting morning. We have Fawn here. And Fawn has chosen to go public with her faith this morning. And so Fawn's story is four months ago when I started coming to this church, I knew God was saying, you're home. Because every song, every sermon I heard, God was talking to me. I have never cried so much at church in my life. (laughs) I think we've all been there. (laughs) That's a beautiful story. So, Fawn, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if you have any questions about what just happened there and maybe that being your next step in your journey with Jesus, we'd love to see you in that class. So let's turn our attention to um, our message for today. We're going to conclude this series and we're going to talk about running well. Maybe you know, back before my knees got some meniscus tears and got scoped out, um, I used to enjoy running back in the day, played soccer and ran to get in shape for soccer. But, you know, once the playing days were over, what do you do? And I've, you know, said this on occasion that old soccer players never fade away. They become distance runners is what they do. And so I started taking up running and I told my wife one day, you know, just one time, I want to do a marathon. And so I trained for that and went up to Logan, started at Hardware Ranch and ran into Logan City and crossed the finish line there. And we got in the car and my wife said to me, well, you did it. And I said, yep. I know I can do better. And so that day, I signed up for another one and sort of this thing unfolded there and did a few more. And then I heard about something called the Boston Marathon. Here's the lure of Boston. You can't just pay your money and sign up and go. You have to qualify for your gender and for your age. And you know, the standard is pretty high. And so trained for that, missed it a couple times, and then I thought for sure that I was ready. And so you know where I went to run a qualifying race? St. George. And when you start out in a marathon, the first 10 miles are easy. The next 8 to 10 are, let's just say, comfortable. And then at some point, it's like somebody straps a piano to your back. (laughs) And it hurts. And so at about mile 20, mile 22, you come into the town of St. George. And when you make your way into the town, there's more people along the side there. And I didn't realize it, but you wear a number with this little bib there, and it has your first name on it. So I'm doing about mile 23 now, what I call the zombie shuffle, where it just hurts and everything inside your body says, just sit down and you're going to feel much better if you just stop doing this right now. And so I'm zombie shuffling and I'm on pace to, to make 
qualification for the Boston Marathon. So I'm like, I got to keep going. But man, does it hurt. All of a sudden, I heard my name. And I don't have the most common name, you know, around. Roy's kind of an old-fashioned name. You don't hear it that much. All of a sudden, I heard, Roy, go Roy. And I looked over, full zombie mode. And there was a lady. I didn't even know who she was. And she saw the name on my bib. And she started cheering for me. And I got to tell you, there was like this little shot of adrenaline where all of a sudden the zombie began to look more like a runner once again. And I kind of picked up the pace a little bit and I thought, I can do this. I can make the Boston qualifying time. Well, about another mile and a half, it hurt again. But then you know who I saw? I saw my family. And they were cheering for me. And that shot of adrenaline crossed the line, qualified for Boston and made the standard. And there's part of that image that we're going to see in the passage today. Because all through Hebrews chapter 11, what the writer has been doing is giving us example after example after example. And now, right at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12, he's going to say, and here's why. Let's remember to whom this was written to one more time. These are people who started strong. They said, you know what? We believe in Jesus. We believe he came so that we could have a relationship with him. But now they are tired of waiting because, you know, life is happening and it's hard and they're getting pushed back and they're losing hope and they're thinking of quitting. And so the writer has said, hey, let me tell you about Moses and let me tell you about David. And let me tell you about Samson. Let me tell you about Gideon. And one after another, people who had experienced these very same things, but they kept running. And so now after that whole chapter, he says, therefore, a long time ago, I heard somebody say, whenever you see therefore, find out what it's there for. Because what follows is based on what just came before it. All of these stories, one after another. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. And can anybody identify with this? So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Keep running. Don't give up. So what is it in this passage that helps us to run well? And maybe you saw this in the first verse there, that a faith is likened to a race. And we think, you know, well, sports is sort of a, a modern sort of thing. Not exactly. It's sort of an ancient thing as well. And back in the day, 2,000 years ago, to have sports competitions was a very common sort of deal. And the word race, by the way, do you know what it is in the original language? It's the word agon or agon. Can you guess what English word we get from that? Agony. Agony. This is mile 23 kind of a race. And so it's interesting that sometimes people say, yeah, you know, faith is a crutch for people who need something to lean on. And I would push back and say on that, you know what? The life of following after God is not for the faint of heart. That is a challenge. And sometimes it's downright hard. And yet it's worth every step. So let's talk about three keys to keep running and running well that come from this passage. Here's the first one. Run encouraged. Run encouraged. Here's what he says in the beginning of that passage. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Who is he talking about here? First, the word cloud can also be used to refer to a crowd of spectators. 
And who is he referring to? Remember, therefore is there for all that preceded it. And it has been one after another, these people who are recorded in the Bible, who put their faith and trust in God and found it at times challenging, but they continued to run so that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, a crowd of spectators of faith. As I mentioned in the ancient world, there are a lot of sports arenas. Um, here's just one that's a great example. Some of them back then seated as many, the largest ones, up to 250,000 people. That's twice as many as will be present at that game this afternoon with two irrelevant teams that <laughs> aren't really worth watching. I'm just a little bitter that the Cowboys aren't there. But in the ancient world, there were a lot of people who showed up for these events just like they do today. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Imagine that you're on the field and your life of faith is unfolding. And you know what? There are spectators in the crowd, the people who have gone before you, the ones that he mentions, and maybe some who have gone before you in your life. And can you imagine the stands filled with people who are saying, keep going, run well, you can do this. And if you have fallen down and if it hurts, you get up and you keep going because it is worth it. And do you know who they're cheering for? You. They're cheering for you. And they know your name. And they're calling you to keep going. And we say, yeah, well, that's easy for them, you know, because look at, you know, they made it, right? Do you know what's happened to me? You know, I lost my sobriety or I did that thing again that I know is not good and right for me, but I did it again. And you know what they would say? Are you familiar with our story? That's part of what was recorded in this whole chapter of why we should continue to go because none of them lived a life that was free from the struggle that is so common with trying to live out faith in this broken world of ours. And yeah, they may sit in the stands today because their time to run the race has ended. But they say to all those who are running today, you keep going and you run well. And they hear your name. And they know your name. So keep running. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And if you think, you know what? Yeah, but if they saw me for who I really am, they'd be booing me, not cheering me. That's not their story. They fell. And they got up. And they finished the race. And if you're hurting or you've fallen, you know what they would encourage you to do? Get up and get back in the race. Your race is not over. And they want you to finish the race. So that's first. Another key to keep running is to run light. Run light. And you know, when you run a long distance, you really don't want to carry a lot of extra baggage, right? Why? Well, came across um, this um, story that kind of bears out, you know, what is mentioned in this passage here. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Run light. How do you run the race? You run it without extra weight and without the sin that clings so closely. This is Lloyd Scott. And as you can tell, he's got a bib on there. And his mission in wearing a 120-pound diving suit was to become the slowest marathon runner of all time. And he succeeded. Um, he ran the London Marathon. He finished in five days, eight hours, 29 minutes, and 46 seconds. Isn't it great that he squeaked in under five days, eight hours, and 30 minutes, you know, by just a couple of seconds there. And he was running with a lot of extra weight. Think about how much more that would add to the difficulty. And I wonder, in life and with faith, could it be that maybe we're running with some extra stuff that weighs us down? Lay aside every weight. And when that is mentioned, that's not you know, this is not an evil thing that's being mentioned there. Maybe a weight 
is something that's even okay, but maybe it's just not the best. Maybe it's a distraction from what needs to be our primary focus. Maybe it's the worry that soaks up so much of our time and energy and has us looking away from who it is that God is calling us to be and what he has for us, but we just get shut down as a result of all the stress and the worry that's around us. And then he also talks about sin. And in the language that's there, it's specific. It could have a definite article that says the sin which clings so closely. And I don't know what that might be for you, but here's my guess, and I believe this is true for me as well. We probably know what that is. We probably know where we are tempted and maybe we have fallen time and time again. Could it be that it is time to say, you know what, I know what it is and it's gotta go. And that's an easy thing for us to say, but I think there's a question that follows right on the heels of that. Okay, great. How do you do that? How do we get rid of those things that weigh us down? How do we get transformed? How is it that we get changed? And I got to tell you, I think this is one of the two most important things when it comes to life with God and faith. The number one important thing, what do we do with Jesus? Have I put my faith and trust in him? That's where a relationship with God begins. And then inside of that relationship, how is it that we can get rid of those things? How do we get transformed? How do we change in, in real terminology? Because it's real easy to say, yeah, we, we need to become the kind of person that we can be, you know, in, inside of a relationship with God. But how, where you and I live, does that actually happen? And I think that's part of what is also mentioned as one of the keys to running is to run focused. So run encouraged. There are people cheering you on. Run light. Get rid of those things that weigh you down. Great. How? Run focused. Check this out. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. You know what doesn't work when we try to change um, these hearts and lives of ours? What doesn't work is when I say, okay, I know what it is that brings me down. I know where I go that I should not go. And so I need to get myself together, look myself in the mirror and tell myself that I can do it and I shouldn't do that and don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. What's the focus of that? It's the thing itself and it's me, right? And so often what we equate faith to is my performance and I need to improve my performance. But that's not what we've been asked to do. And so often what happens is that people can experience, you know, the difficulty that comes along with that. And maybe we see how people crash and burn their faith around us and walk away from it. And we say, you know, maybe I just need to check out of this altogether. And I'm going to say something here on this next slide that may be controversial. And if you want to email me about it, it's jimmy at whc.faith. <laughs> but here it is. Don't place your faith in Christianity. Place your faith in Christ. And there <laughs> is a huge difference between those two things. Right? Our hope is not in an organization. Our hope is not in anybody that talks into a microphone like this or anybody who's a part of this church or any other church. Our hope is in Christ. What does that writer say to the people who are on the verge of quitting and are feeling like their hope is evaporating? He says, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, the one who started it and the one who can complete it. At the end of the day, it's not even up to you and me that there is a place for us to go that is so much bigger and better than who we are, looking to Jesus. And so often, you know what performance does? And, and I know this from my own experience, right? I've been in a relationship with God for about 40 years. 
And I know early on there was this desire to get real serious about God and think, okay, can't do that, shouldn't do that, don't even think about that, and start doing this, that, and the other thing, and you start working it really hard. You know what also happens? Not just that you focus on the things you shouldn't and you focus on yourself. Do you know what that eventually leads to? A sense of arrogance and judgmentalism that wonders why everybody else isn't trying as hard as you are and coming down on people for the many ways in which they fall short of maybe where you have, you know, willed yourself and meanwhile being totally blind to the many ways in which I might still sin. But I can be so arrogant and judgmental of people who sin differently than I do. And boy, is that not the life that God has invited us to experience. So how is it that that changes? How do we turn away from sin and bad habits? Keep looking to Jesus. How do we stay on track in a day that is so politically um, just tense? Keep looking to Jesus. How do we stay on track in a day that is so polarized and people are saying all kinds of things about each other and to each other and just mean-spiritedness and judgmentalism seems to often rule the day? Keep looking to Jesus. How do you live in a day that has become so rude and, and so filled with just the spirit of, I don't know, taking other people out at the knees. You keep looking to Jesus. And this is not some deep, dark, mysterious sort of idea, is it? It's not something where you've got to crack some secret spiritual code and get inside the mind and heart of God and only a few people can achieve, you know, that highest level of what it means to walk with Him. This is simply people who say, you know what? In this broken world of ours, my primary focus needs to be Jesus. And instead of focusing on all the things that bring us down, instead of focusing on me, myself, and I, I've been invited to look to Jesus. The message of the Bible is not try harder, be better, do the work, perfect yourself. That's not the message of the Bible at all. The message of the Bible, what is it? Trust Jesus and stay focused on him. And here's how he wraps up that section. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was the joy that was set before him? It's not the cross itself. That was really painful physically It was also painful spiritually, you know why? Because when Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to that cross, you know what he did? He took upon himself the sin of everyone who would ever put trust in him and he made payment for it. And there was this agony of separation from God the Father in that moment. And he did that for you. What was the joy? It was the people who would step into that relationship with God. And it was all that would be on the other side of that eternity with a community of people who would put hope and trust in Him. So part of that joy, if you put your trust in Him, it's you. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. How do you run well? Well, you run encouraged and never alone. All those who have gone before you, they cheer your name. You run light. We set aside the things that weigh us down and we run focused. It really is all about Jesus. And the race that is faith is not easy but it is worth 
every step. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads together with me. And in just a moment, after we pray, I've asked Marshall to come and sing a song for us that allows us to just hear that simple focus. It really is all about Jesus. And God, in this world, there are so many ways for us to begin well, but then wind up with questions, doubts, hurts, concerns, challenges. And God, in this day, it's certainly not the first time that people have maybe felt the temptation to, to give up, to stop running. And so, God, I pray that you would give us the perspective to be able to see that things, in a lot of ways, haven't changed in this world much at all. And yet, what has changed is that God's love came, that Jesus came, God in the flesh, to offer us himself, a relationship with you, our hope is not a way, it's not a direction, it's not a philosophy, our hope is Jesus. And so God, would you occupy more of our focus and attention, help us to lay aside many of the things that have the capability to draw our attention in a day like this. And maybe there be an opportunity to focus all the more on you. And we ask and pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram, and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.